Cool. Uh, well, welcome everyone uh, to, to Homework 4 Bootcamp. So uh, in this bootcamp, we'll cover P1 and P2. So first we'll go through the P1 part and then uh, Clay, uh, Clay will go through the P2 part. The P1 part is basically relatively easy. It's the easiest homework you could have seen till now. And click, uh, can you enable like screen sharing? Is it? I enabled it. Could you try it? Okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's in. Yeah. So uh, in, in the part one, uh, what you all have to do is basically work on um, you know, language generation model. Uh, yeah, yeah, it will be easier. So uh, most, most of the structure of the code is uh, given to you. You won't have to change anything in it. Uh, you, you would just have to implement the functions in the object class was probably you wouldn't even have to actually start a new uh, object class. So uh, in, the, in, in this homework here, you're basically given texts and you have to ge generate a, a text uh, given a particular word or a given a particular sequence. So you'll first, uh, there are two components in this homework. One is the prediction part where you're predicting a world. And then there's one generation part where uh, you're generating a sequence of text, uh, given a sequence of input text. So uh, the easiest way to get through uh, this homework is basically following this paper. Uh, and uh, when, you, when you follow this paper, you uh, you can just uh, pass the test in like uh, three uh, three to five epochs, so that won't be a problem. Yeah, hopefully you have gone through the IPython notebook and saw the different object class and functions you you have to implement. I'll go through it quickly after this. Uh, so. Uh, you have like uh, four different files uh, given to you as an input data set where you have like a vocabulary, vocabulary list which contains full list of words. And then you have like two different files which contains the text on which you will actually be training your model and as well as a validation test where you, you, you can uh, see your performance uh, of, of your model. So uh, in this uh, first idea is like to uh, implement the data, data loader uh, where what you basically do is first you have to implement it in the data function. So the problem for what you're dealing with is that, let's take an example over here. So if I have a, a your validation, this uh, this uh, num, numpy file contains the, the the training set, and each uh, each entry is like a sentence. Sentence is uh, very similar to this sentence here. I eat I I eat a banana and apple every day, including today. So this is your whole sentence. And what you're basically uh, have to do is that your input or input would be like, if, if, if I'm saying that my sequence length is three, then your input would be like, I eat a, and then your target would be eat a banana. So that's like you are taking three words as an input and generating three words as an output. 
And so that's like a whole data loader you have to do. And this like uh, the task is like, uh, if, if, you, if you get a string like this, I eat a banana and apple every day, including today. The first task is you have to go, uh, concatenate the whole data set and then generate uh, generate sequences of the well, both input and the target variable, like you see over here, and sample one and sample two. And then once you uh, group them into batches, you just have to run the loop and yield the data. So yield, uh, you have to not return the data because you are using a generator, uh, generator class here. And that's why you have to use yield. Maybe you should uh, look up uh, yield if you're not familiar with it. For the model, actual model part, you can use like, a, as just scanned in the paper, you can look at it. It's basically like an uh, LSTM layer. You only have to like implement, uh, write like three lines of code in it. And uh, uh, in case you, you, you don't know like uh, to apply paid decay and you know, uh, embedding dropout and log dropout. The, these are like the, the, the suggestions where you, uh, which you can actually implement to uh, pass this, uh, pass it on uh, Autolab. But the only main thing like you might really need is that these two things, maybe apply log dropout and embedding dropout and maybe include weight decay as well. The other things are very, optional in case you your model performance is not really great then you might have to actually implement the other stuff as well but from my experience you might not need uh, to implement uh, other things and regarding your test uh, mm, test accuracy you if you're like really if you have implemented everything as described in the paper, uh, then you, you can actually pass it on onto lab in just like three to six epochs. And the metric which we are using is basically negative log likelihood, which you have to actually score below 5.4 to get the full grades. I think for, yeah, so like I mentioned previously that uh, there are like two tasks, uh, prediction task and generation task. Uh, so that's about it. I'll quickly go through the uh, notebook, uh, the iPython notebook, which uh, you'll be implementing. So let me share. Yeah, so hope uh, I hope everyone can see the notebook. So um, most of the things are already implemented, but uh, what you have to actually implement is the data loader and the model, but how to save the model, how to do prediction, most of the things are already implemented. So over here you, you'll First, in it initialize the uh, given in the data. And over here, like uh, mentioned in the write up, first you have to concatenate, take it into batches, and then yield every data. So uh, when you look at, uh, when you read the paper, uh, you'll see that uh, the way they are generating. Uh, and to generating the inputs is basically like having uh, a random uh, random sampler 
So like uh, they're uh, generate taking in some random number, maybe a, a, a probability number from zero to one. And if that number is like mm, less than no, say less than 0 0.5, 0 0.95, then the distribution from which you sample the data is different than if it is less than 0 0.95. So you have to actually uh, sample sample the text from a distribution. You can look it up. It's actually a normal distribution from which you have to sample the data. And then over here, you have to implement the basic uh, your language model, this kind of uh, LSTM. It's basically like uh, you can include on uh, the drop um, dropout uh, and have a, uh, a language model, uh, which is LSTM with different feature output. That's about it. And yeah, all these things are like implemented for you. Just initialize your optimizer and the loss. And then over here, what you are basically doing is uh, you have to implement this on a batch of input to implement this. This is implemented for you. And after, after doing the testing part, you don't have to change this. The only thing in this uh, classes you have to implement the train batch, which is basically you, you, you have done so long. It's similar to that. And yeah, and after that, this basically saves the model for every run ID. So run ID is basically like you're doing something, something like, Run ID, um, it's basically the run time, I guess. So you can get run ID, something like this. Time dot time. You can get run ID like this. So uh, every prediction is saved under the uh, under the experiment folder, and Every every epoch is saved with run ID and the epoch number, and you have to, so the output of these things are basically your prediction output, prediction test, generated logic, uh, generated logic test, and the actual text of the prediction. So these are the stuff. So you don't have to worry about it. You don't have to change anything here. Now comes the test language model. It's very, it's like you're doing it on this, doing like a sequence part of it. So in here you are generating, you are actually working on generated model. So here you implement for prediction, which is actually a single word. And over here you are generating a sequence of as mentioned in the credo. And that's pretty much it. You don't have to actually do anything. Just mention your uh, epoch size, and uh, number of epoch and batch size. And that's it. You have the code for plotting, the code for, you know, the training and how to save the model is already implemented for you. See, so the run ID is also here. Everything is implemented for you. So there's not much of the work to, for you to do here. Uh, so yeah, that's pretty much it. Do you guys have any question?
so we, we are doing it in the iter object because it's a generator and we have to heal the data because we are sampling it from a data uh, from from a particular distribution we are not actually saving it to, in memory we are doing it in fly so that's why we are implementing it i need to plan I don't think the, you really need to have any additional function. Most of the stuff are, is already there. So you might not need to actually start a new function or a new object class. This is actually pretty easy. I know it might sound like uh, there's not much to do, but it was meant to be, uh, this homework was meant to be easy because the P2 part is really, it takes time. And that's why the, the part one part is intended to be easy. And in fact, like if you, if, if you uh, look through the paper, uh, go through the paper ones and see how they are actually Take it, taking in uh, taking in from a particular distribution, taking in the data from a particular distribution and their language model, you can implement this, uh, uh, the whole homework. You can complete the whole homework in like two hours. So it won't take much time. Any other question? Uh, two hours for part one. Uh, I'm not saying like two hours is, you know, you, you shouldn't take more than two hours. It's just like you can actually implement this homework in two hours. Part two will take time. You can't complete part two in two hours. Because part one, you, you only have to train like 10 epochs, less than 10 epochs, and you can get good predictions. And each epoch uh, doesn't take much time. All right, if there are no other questions, then maybe we should get to the part two. All right. Uh, can everyone see my screen? Yeah, I think so. So the part two write-up is pretty lengthy. Um, we highly recommend you to go through it before you start. We gave out a pretty good, um, like a thorough things that you need to consider introduction, uh, like what kind of data set we provided. We have provided the toy data set. Um, I guess to point a few important parts, you definitely want to uh, first use the toy data set to see if your attention implementation is correct. Um, I think this is probably the part that most students suffer the most from. Um, if their attention implementation is incorrect, they're you know, the whole modeling will break down. Um, and this toy data set is really small. And we'll, we will cover how to draw these uh, plots, but essentially what it means is um, for each target, uh, like for each target sequence and for the each input sequence, we're trying to see if the attention, uh, so attention here is, you know, as you can see from the, um, this thing on in the y-axis here that it's darker if it's higher. So we're trying to see if there is a higher attention cluster in the diagonals of uh, these, this hit map. And you'd want to see something closer, close to that, like a uh, attention, high attention scores in the diagonal, but not necessarily as, um, you know, as clear as the left plot. You can see something like on the right plot or even a fuzzier one. 
and that shouldn't be a matter. You should definitely, as soon as you see something like this, um, you should move on to like the real data set essentially. Um, so yeah, this is one thing to keep in mind. And uh, for the approaches, we suggested three different papers here. So LAS, listen, append, and spell is probably the most, um, the model that most students uh, implement. It's also the same model that most TAs are familiar with. Uh, we just added some optional ones, show, attend, and tell, and then the annotated attention is all you need. This would be the implementation of transformers. Um, I think at least for the transformer model, many TAs are quite familiar with this uh, model. So if you want, if you want, you will be able to get enough support from the TAs as well. But I think the data wise, the sequence length is typically very long. Um, and you know, self attention is quadratically dependent on the sequence length. So I'm not, I can't really say uh, use implementing transformers will actually give you the benefit of uh, faster training time and everything. But obviously it's up to you. And then after that, we have a pretty detailed description of the LAS model. Um, some notations in the LAS model are quite confusing. Like uh, we went through it yesterday in our recitation, um, but we also have clarified those confusions in, the, uh, in this section 4.1. We also provided this up updated plot. So in the figure one of LAS paper, I believe they provided something like this, but that's quite confusing. So we recommend you instead uh, look at this plot. Um, and then from section 4.2, we we just pr provided some, some of the key points that you may want to consider um, when implementing the details, essentially. Um, we're not going to go over this today because we're, we're planning to just go over the code instead. But um, yep, I highly recommend uh, you go through all of these, um, especially like after you after you're somewhat done implementing your baseline model, you may want to uh, revisit these details to you know increase your performance and everything. Um, I guess I'll I'll need to have a chat here somewhere. All right. Um, I guess for today, uh, we will quickly do a recap of LAS model that we went over yesterday since some students may not have visited the recitation. And then um, after that, we'll, we'll essentially just go over the entire code. Um, I, I guess uh, I hope you have read the notebook at least once, but then we, you might have noticed that we there are more comments than the code blocks itself. So. Um, as long as you follow these comments, um, you shouldn't have too much problems, um, you know, implementing all, all these like encoder, decoder, attention, and and the final sec to sec uh, uh, class. But we'll we'll also go over them uh, in 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 very detail. So, all right. Any question before we start uh, start explaining the LIS model? So for the LAS model is a encoder decoder architecture. It's essentially the same architecture that we've been studying uh, this week. Um, so this part is the listener part, which is the encoder part. Um, it, it is very similar to the typical encoders we've been seeing, but um, it's actually a pyramidal LSTM. Uh, the reason we can we want to use this pyramidal sort of LSTM is that the input sequences for the speech that are typically very long, uh, you might have noticed from your homework three that sequence length is you know well over the range of thousands, right? Um, whereas our target sequence length is quite short. For example, for this data set, I would say most of your target will be um, you know less than a sequence length of 100, uh, whereas your input length will be well over thousands. So. Um, at least the paper suggests using a pyramidal LSTM so, so that they can reduce the input sequence length. Uh, so here, for example, uh, we generate one output for each. So this bottom LSTM is just a normal uh, bi-directional LSTM. So for example, if the hidden dimension for each thing um, 
is like say 128, then you will be outputting something like 256 dimensional vector. And then uh, you will be, every layer you go up in the pyramid, you will be concatenating the two vectors that outputted by the, you know, the previous LSTM layer. So here, for example, we, we have uh, 256 direction dimensional vectors, and then we concatenate every two time steps. Uh, and then we make that uh, as an input to the second DLSTM layer. And then we also do the same for the, uh, uh, the second uh, pyramidal BLSTM. And then in this image, there's only two uh, pyramidal BLSTMs, but in the actual paper, you will notice that uh, there has to be three pyramidal BLSTMs. Um, and since every layer we go up, we reduce the input length by a factor of two, three pyramidal BLSTMs would mean that we reduce the input length by a factor of eight. Oh yeah, and here are some concerns you need to obviously um, take care of in, in this thing is that you have to reduce the input length um, by concatenating every two time steps. And then in case there is an odd length input, um, you can either pad your input or you can just throw away the last frame. It won't affect your performance that much. Concatenation is always the second uh, option. So a student asks, by concatenation, does it mean we take an average of the two vectors or we literally concat like append the two vectors? It, it should be the second one. Um, you have a length uh, times two after you concatenate. Right, any question on the listener part? I think most students visited the recitation yesterday, so uh, must be familiar with this. So this is the decoder part, um, what they call a tendon spell. Um, so here H is just the concatenation of all the hidden vectors from your reduced input sequence. Uh, so here, since we reduce it by the factor of eight, so this length of this H will always be uh, reduced your original input sequence reduced by a factor of eight. Um, and obviously you don't have to use this. Uh, for example, um, you can actually just, um, you know, have, a, have another matrix here and then uh, project these H, this H concatenated hidden vectors into a key and value. Um, you know, this is something a lot of you must be uh, might be more familiar with. And then once we have uh, the key and value, um, and then this, uh, hold on, so let's say this is HS1, then these will be the queries. Um, so, you know, we've dealt with a lot of different attentions um, in, the, in the lectures and recitation. If you aren't, please uh, try to revisit them. And then, so you can essentially use whatever attention you want, whether it's a dot product attention, scale dot product attention, multi-headed attention, um, or even bilinear attention, whatever you want on these uh, key query value uh, tuples, essentially. Um, and then, so with the attention, you will generate a context vector, um, which will then be concatenated with this uh, S1. So when you're outputting this character distribution, you can see that it depends on SI and CI. Uh, so this MLP layer will take a um, you know, concatenated hidden vector uh, outputted from your decoder, S SI, and then the context vector you generated with uh, your encoder hidden, encoder hidden vector, CI. Uh, you will typically concatenate them. Uh, and then I guess for, uh, I guess just maybe you can just quickly just go over these. Uh, so when you're generating the context, you use SI, which is the output of your decoder um, RNN. So here, this, whatever the output, um, oh, actually, this might be a little bit confusing. So whatever you output from this decoder um, will be SI, which will be used as a query. Um, and then you will be calculating uh, your attention and everything 
which eventually will lead to a context vector, uh, CI. And then uh, your RNN will depend on, so for example, it will depend on the SI minus one, you know, whatever the hidden vectors that came from uh, the previous, previous time step. And then I minus one would be, uh, you know, whatever you generated from the previous time step, because this, uh, this will obviously go like this. And then um, what's the other one? Uh, so typically uh, you will concatenate these two. This is also another uh, little bit confusing part. Um, for your RNN, this SI minus one will just be a hidden vector from the previous time step. And then I, YI minus one and CI minus one will be a concatenated vector that you will be um, inputting to your RNA. And in the paper, they used dot product attention. They didn't use key value kind of paradigm. They just used the raw hidden vectors, in which case uh, your key and value would be the same, but you don't have to, um, you can just use you can just add another layer of linear projections to make it our key value um, pairs, which we'll go over in the code itself as well. Right, any question on the decoder part? Right. Yeah, if you're confused about the architecture, like uh, did a pretty thorough um, explanation in the recitation, so uh, you're free to just revisit it later on. All right, so uh, this is a template we provided. Um, we will just go over line by line, uh, function by function, essentially. So these are the uh, list of letters that we provided. So as you can see, these are the like letter list is essentially the vocab. Um, we have a SOS token and EOS token, which we learned to be the, um, in the start of the sentence, end of the sentence uh, marks. And then as you can see, the vocab here we're using is, um, you know, the alphabet. Uh, there is a line in the right up, I, be, I believe, section 4.3, uh, whether you should use character-based or word-based. Um, it's totally up to you. I think the paper used character based. Most TAs are also quite familiar with the character based method. Uh, but if you if you choose to implement a vocab word based model, then obviously your letter list will have to change, and it it has to be you know uh, like whatever vocab you have in your training data. Okay, so. The first two functions are just utility functions. Um, the create dictionary function, you have to, given the letter list, um, you know, letter, list of characters if you're a character-based model or list of vocabs if you're a word-based model, you will have to generate two mapping. One is a letter to index mapping and the other is index to letter mapping. This is, you know, like we can't use the discrete variables like letters directly. We, we you know, almost, you must be familiar with this, but we uh, essentially map these to some kind of indexes that we can use to uh, for a lookup table, um, you know, like the torch and then dot embedding. Um, so essentially what you're gonna be doing in this utility function is you map each of them to some kind of index, uh, which will be the letter to index mapping and then index to letter mapping will be the reverse mapping of that. Uh, so you'll just create something like this and then transform letter to index, um, you know, is just another utility function your train labels will be in letters, like some, some English. Uh, so this function, you know, will just map whatever letters you have into a list of indices. Any question on this function? We're just uh, you know loading the data part. Um, nothing too fancy here. Um, okay, so here is just the uh, your data set implementation. Uh, so in homework four part one, we asked you to just implement the data loader directly, which you only have to implement the um, iter function. But this is just the data set uh, that you're more familiar with. Um, and collate functions are also pretty much the same as the one you. Uh, implement in homework three. So we'll, we'll not go over this uh, in too much detail. I think for the data set, I, I believe this should uh, work almost you know, off the shelf. 
except for maybe the data type convert conversion uh, needs to. Um, so these data set, mm, maybe, uh, not too sure. I, I haven't actually checked the names of the data sets in the Kaggle, but um, you can just pick, change these names uh, depending on which data set you're working on. Okay, so here's just, uh, you create the data sets and the data loaders. Um, so here's the first model class. Uh, so here P, B, L, S, T, M will be the pyramidal by L, S, T, M, which will essentially be um, like this. Um, so we observed a lot of students from last semester um, actually trying to implement the entire P, B, L, S, B, L, S, T, M um, in one class and we, we recommend you to instead um, Im implement one layer at a time. So essentially, like um, if your input X is packed, uh, we provided like step-by-step -step guidance. If your input is packed, you can just pad it. Uh, you probably did this in homework three. And then after you pad it, you need to truncate your input length dimension. You know, we have to concatenate every two time steps, right? So the first thing is uh, when the input length is even number of length, then you probably not have to worry about it. When it's odd number, as you said, you can either discard it or you can just pad it uh, up to you. Um, and then after, so after that, truncating here really just means um, concatenating, right? Um, so we concatenate the two vectors and then we go through this uh, self.blstm layer. Uh, so you, you need to fill out the rest of the input function parameters here, but then uh, just make sure to set num layers equals to one so that we essentially deal with one layer at a time. Um, and then you can just pack it again, um, pack it again, pass into LSTM layer, just return, uh, return the output essentially. Um, any question on the PBLSTM part? Like it shouldn't be too much. Uh, it should be like five lines of code in the board. Um, it, yep. So after you you know make it modular, you will be essentially able to put it into like a, an end dot sequential met, um, class. So like P, there will be one the first layer P B L S T M, and then optionally you can apply dropout or a um, like a locked dropout, um, like we mentioned it for homework part one. Um, and then you can add another PBLSTM layer, um, like the second layer of PBLSTM, and then the third layer of PBLSTM. Um, we highly recommend you to put at least um, three pyramidal BLSTMs in the encoder part so that you can sufficiently decrease the uh, sequence length of your input. Um, otherwise, it may take a lot of time to, for your model to converge, essentially. Um, and this this layer, LSTM layer will just be the bottom LSTM layer uh, like we have here. Okay, so the forward um, pass of your entire encoder is also pretty straightforward. Um, so first of all, if you if you haven't packed your input in your data loader, you should pack it here, and then we first um, pass it through the first. Uh, I guess here we pass through the first uh, bi-directional LSTM layer. And then after that, we just pass your input to the pyramidal BLSTM's uh, you know, layers. Since the truncation and everything is done in the forward function of the uh, PBLSTM, um, you won't have to worry about anything. And then after you have the output from the PBLSTM, you can pad it to you know shape uh, into the batch sequence length Feature, feature shape or, or the sequence length batch feature shape. Um, and then, you, so if, you, if you're if you using attention based on this, um, you know, concatenated hidden vectors, you can just um, output that as a key and value. So here's the first case. Uh, and then if you want to have a separate key and value, then you can essentially uh, have two additional key and value networks here. And then just you know linearly project it, return your key and value. And uh, um, another thing you 
might you probably need is also since you truncate your um, input length, you have to also output the uh, length of your input as well. That's that's something that's returned by uh, your pad pack sequence function. So it's not uh, very complicated. I guess. Any question on the encoder part? <clears throat> Uh, this is just here to, uh, you know, suggest you to try your encoder in some tiny um, sample before you move on to the next step. Uh, so here we have the plot attention function. Um, this attention needs to be like uh, some kind of 2D array. Um, it's visited. You know, like something like a 2D array, something like this, so that we can check how the attention weights are in the diagonals of this uh, 2D array. And so this is the attention class. Uh, we provided pretty thorough um, guideline on how you can implement this. Uh, so first to quickly go over, in the forward function, you will have, uh, you will need query key value and mask. And here the mask is uh, probably the more confusing part. And you essentially need math to, um, you know, you, so we are always pad our input sequence, you know, uh, by the maximum sequence length of in that batch. So for those sequences that are, that corresponds to zeros in your input, we want to mask that uh, into some very low values so that when you take a soft max, um, they will be assigned essentially like a zero probability or like a zero attention weight uh, when you calculate their uh, final attention weight. So this mask is uh, probably important and we will um, go over how to create this mask um, in the decoder class. But essentially the main takeaway from this mask is that uh, you want to give the mask portion or the you want to give the padded portion of your input a very low value so that when you take a softmax function, um, those portions will be assigned a very low attention weight. Okay, so, and then here's the very, here's many different ways of calculating attentions. Um, you are given key query and value here. Uh, the, what the paper implements is dot product attention. You can implement a scale dot product um, by normalizing with a square root of key dimension. You can check the attention is all you need paper. Cosine attention is another famous um, one to be used. It's pretty much the dot product attention, but you normalize by uh, your key and query, I guess. And by linear attention, you'll have to introduce another uh, linear transformation, a learnable parameter, um, so that you will do something like this. Uh, the, oh, here, I guess, uh, BMM here is just a batch-wise matrix multiplication. So your key dimension will be something like, um, you know, batch size by sequence length by your key value, um, like key dimension. Um, and then your query will be also like something like this. Essentially, it does matrix multiplication for each of the batch. And then it just concatenates the result at the end so that uh, you keep the batch dimension in the first place. You can actually just replace this with a normal matrix multiplication. It it, it work uh, just as fine. Like for example, if you if you want to implement for like a self attention, then your key and query will be a four dimensional vector. Um, in that case, you won't be able to use BMM uh, because BMM requires your inputs to be three dimensional. Um, so that's something you should keep in mind. And then. Uh, if, if you want to do something a little more fancy, you can actually implement a MLP layer for your uh, energy. So essentially whatever we do here, uh, we compute the energy, which is the um, unnormalized attention weight. And after we obtain this energy factor here, um, we have to use the mask to, you know, as you said, we want to assign those padded values, extremely low value, uh, say something like negative one E9. Uh, we mask, we um, you know, assign 
very low values for those uh, mass portions. And then we take a soft max of the energy uh, to turn it into you know, the probability distribution. Although, as I clarified yesterday, attentions are never uh, interpreted as probability distribution. And then you finally compute your context uh, by taking a batchwise matrix multiplication between attention and value. Um, I also gave a um, you know, guideline for multi-head attention. Multi-head attention is slightly different because um, there is also output weight matrix, output linear transformation. And um, so here for the encoder part, we suggested using um, key value network linear transformations in the encoder part. Um, but for the, actually, um, it, this is probably uh, my mistake. Uh, so you don't need to have a key and value weight matrix in this class because we had it in the encoder. Um, but I guess I, I'll just leave it here um, for to denote by key and value. But essentially what you need to do is you have to reshape your key. Uh, you have to split your key by the number of heads. So if H here is the number of heads, um, you have to reshape your key and value into you know, batch batch by sequence length by number of heads by the dimension of key value divided by h. So your dk has to be a you know multiply multiply you know like a factor of your number of heads. And then you have to transpose it to you know batch size by number of head size by sequence length by dk divided by h so that you can take a uh, matrix wise or, or matrix multiplication between key and uh, query and key. Uh, so essentially you just need to note that uh, when we're computing energy, we, you know, take a matrix multiplication between query and key. And so here we can see the query dimension is dq divided by h, and key dimension is um, sequence length by dk divided by h. So you just need to transpose your key uh, so that it's batch size by h by, you know, dk by, trans, uh, DK by sequence length then you'll be able to take a you know, matrix multiplication and then everything else is quite similar. You need to mask your energy um, for those padded values. And then you take a tension soft, you, you take a soft mix to calculate your tension. Um, and then, and then, yep. So the multi hat here is just corresponds to uh, this context part. Um, and then, you know, we reshape it just we, we just concatenate it and then just, um, you know, this the w, WO is probably the only different part uh, that you need to take care of. Is there a kind of local test to see if our implementation of a single component is correct? I guess implementing so many components with no test. Um, like, what would you mean by a local test? Like, um, Mm, like you can obviously check uh, if your if your class is working correctly by having a small mini sample and see if all your shapes and everything are based on matching. And then for the attention part, as you said, um, if you can, if you if your code can actually plot a diagonal line like this, if you if you're seeing that your uh, when you're generating some target target sequence, your in, you're attending to the diagonal portion of your input sequence, then it probably means that your attention is also correct. Um, otherwise, you know, I guess defining what it, what is even like a correct um, thing in a deep learning model is very difficult. So I would say um, it's not easy to have like a local test that will guarantee the correctness of your implementation. And uh, for the second question, can we use and then that multi head attention? Uh, you're not allowed to use and then that multi head attention. And the and then that multi head attention, uh, the masking part for that class is a little confusing. So it'll probably be easy for you to just implement it on your own. Um, at least that's how I found it. What is the dimension of energy? Um, did I provide it? So the dimension of your energy will be, like in this case, it will be a batch size by sequence length, I think. Uh, but you, you can just confirm it on your own, right? Um, 
like so key here is batch size by sequence length by dk query here is the batch size by d query and here you'll probably have dk and dq the same dimension so when you take a batch wise matrix multiplication it will just be a uh the batch size by sequence length and essentially you know um let's see let's go back to yep right here so the attention, the main idea behind attention is to assign some kind of importance weight to each of your input in your sequence, right? Um, so let's say we have a batch size of one, um, then it, the T here will correspond to the sequence length of that one batch, in one, one sequence in your batch, right? Um, so it makes sense that what we want to output, like our attention should be the sequence length because it, it has to be the importance weight for each of the input in your sequence. Um, and then if you have more than one sequence in your batch, um, like that sequence length will depend on the maximum length of your sequence, right? Or like maximum sequence length in, in that batch. Uh, so essentially what you will want is um, like, say we have another sequence here. And let's say the sequence length for this second batch is three and the sequence length of your first batch is five then you want to output a probability distribution that looks something like this for your first batch. And then for your second batch, uh, you'll want to output uh, zero attention for these two things because these are padded values. And uh, this is what's being taken care of by this mask part. We assign a very low value to these, uh, to these, you know, to these portions of the input so that when we take a soft max, they'll be essentially assigned zero attention weight. And then, uh, you know, like these three things will be assigned some kind of you know, non-trivial um, non attention weight um, when we finish computing the attention. Why not make it zero? Um, what do you mean? We are making zero. If, if you assign like a very large negative value, um, then when you take a softmax, they will naturally be uh, zero values. Like if you if you're talking about assigning after assigning zeros after softmax, then you know these non-zero values will have an if, like affect your attention computation. Like your softmax computation will be affected by these non-zero values. So that's not something we want. Uh, that's why we're just masking these with some kind of very large negative values like this. Um, the point of masking, as I said here, um, is that, so I'll try to draw a little more clearly. Like, let's say the we have a batch size of two. The first sequence length has, you know, sequence length of five. And then let's say, um, like, let's consider these blocks as our second batch. Um, like, and then these two, these two sequence in this batch is just padded values. Um, so by masking, we can assign zero attention weight to these two sequence. And that's what we want because these are padded values. We don't want to actually consider them when, when um, computing the output probability. Um, so we're by masking these two with some very large values, when we take a soft max, they will be assigned zero attention weight. And then these three, um, inputs in your sequence will be assigned a non-trivial attention weight. And for the first sequence in your batch, you want them to have some kind of non-trivial weights like this. Um, in case those zero padding don't eat up attention for real entries, um, yes, I, I think, I think uh, what you're saying is essentially correct. If we don't mask these two things, then they might have some, you know, some values, whatever values it has, if it's not negative enough, then when we take a soft max, they will be assigned some kind of non-trivial attention weight. Um, so by, by giving them, by masking them with some real negative values, 
you know, the softmax is like, like this, right? Um, we take a sum of all the exponentials and then uh, we divide the single exponential by the sum. So if, if this EI for these two mass portion is, you know, if these portions are like very low numbers, then this attention weight will essentially go to zero. Uh, why are we not considering the last two inputs in the sequence again? Um, so essentially, so in this case, uh, let's, it's, this batch is like this. So this is the batch side. And then this five is the maximum sequence length. So here, our first element in our batch is a sequence of length five. That's what we're assuming. And then in the second, um, second element in the batch, which is this one, that is that um, is has a length of three, uh, like like these ones. And then these two, since you know we do we pad our input in our data loader, right? So these two inputs will be the padded values. Um, can you explain again why not just making the attention weight zero? Oh, uh, sure. So <clears throat> let's say. <clears throat> uh, <clears throat> let's say we don't mask here. So we, we computed some kind of energy here, um, whatever attention you wanted to use. And then let's say we don't do this. Then when we take a softmax score, the portions of your input that are padded will also gain some kind of non-trivial weight. So if we just give them zero after, so if we assign zeros in this line after we take a softmax, then the rest of the weights that you have, so here, i.e. the three inputs here, the weights of them will not sum up to one. Since, you know, we define attention, we like, it's a kind of a nice property we want, but the attention weights sum up to one. So uh, to preserve that property, essentially, uh, we mask before doing softmax. So I guess uh, maybe to quickly, um, we will come back to this um, in our decoder, but you know, since we have some example here, so the first case we have sequence length of phi, and in the second case we have a sequence length of three. So uh, this in this case our mask will have have to be something like one 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 zero zero. Um, so our mask looks like this then um, we can essentially, there is a torch function. Um, I think it's mask filled in or mask fill in or something like that. You can search it up, um, but you can essentially provide this mask um, and then fill out all the portions of your input that are assigned zero as some high negative values like one E nine, one E negative nine. So we are doing softmax on three elements. Um, no, the softmax itself will be always performed on five because that's the maximum sequence length. Uh, remember that uh, I think Sean probably asked me before that the dimension of your energy or dimension of your attention will be you know, the batch size by sequence length. Um, so here it'll be two by five because batch size is two and maximum sequence length is five. So your softmax will always be taken on, on the sequence dimension. So it will, it will be performed on five elements, but since these two padded values have extremely negative values, they will just be assigned zero, so that's fine. Uh, for this multi-hat attention, is this multiple self-attentions or multiple attentions? Uh, the self-attention and multi-hat attention is actually different things. Um, so I guess, um, maybe I can come back to that question because uh, I, I would need to erase all this. Uh, so I'll, I'll, I'll visit other questions first and then I'll come back to that uh, question, Jessica, if that's okay with you. So when mask, um, when mask, their padded values will be assigned big negative values. Yes. Um, so something like this. So you can kind of think, um, you know, uh, so let's consider a softmax of three elements. Like, let's say the first is one, second element is um, just one, and then the last element is some very high negative value. Then the softmax of the first element will be, you know, e to the two divided by 
e to the two plus e to the one plus e to the uh, like something like this, right? And this will probably be assigned a decent value, like really high value as a matter of fact. But then if you consider the last element, um, the soft max value of this thing, uh, you know, let's say this is the sigma, then it will be it will be like a e to the negative one e to the negative nine nine divided by the sum, which will essentially be like close to zero. It will, it will be zero essentially. So when mass, the pattern values will be assigned big negative values. Um, yes, by assigning a very big negative value in the energy. So here, um, as you said, if our mask looks like this in this two batch example, uh, these two things, components that are marked as zero will be added some very negative value like E negative nine. And then when we take a soft max, it will be assigned like a zero weight. All right, any confusion? Um, I would like you to have um, a full understanding of this before we move um, on. Hi, um, I just want to make sure that when you assign a big value, like e to the power of negative nine, that's like close to zero though. That's not a big negative values. Um, what do you mean? Like this is a big negative value, right? Yeah, but what what you wrote on the on the left hand like on your slides is like e to the negative nine, oh, which is oh. different from I'm what sorry. you have on the notebook. Yeah, I'm sorry, it's a negative e uh negative nine, or like I'm sorry uh yes, you're absolutely correct. Uh, it'll be like like okay. this. Okay, thank you. Yep. Thanks for clarification. Right, so no more question on the uh, attention and energy part. All right. So coming back to Jessica's question for this multi-head attention, is this multiple self attention or uh, multiple attention? So the answer to your question um, the short answer is the second one, it's the multiple attention. Um, so here in this case, um, you know, when we aren't using a linear projection for key and values like this. So here we have like key and value matrix, right? Um, but um, let's say we are actually just using this original, um, you know, LA, LAS uh, implementation. And in this case, I said they just use a concatenated hidden vector here without projecting this into some kind of key and value, uh, uh, key and value like values essentially. And in that case, this is a special case of um, key equals value equals hidden dimension of your uh, encoder. As I said, uh, the original LAS implementation concatenates all the hidden vectors outputted by your encoder and then use that as analogous to key and value. So here it's a special case where key and value are exactly the same. And self attention is another special case where that key and value and query are essentially all the same. So multi-head attention and self attention are completely independent things. Um, you know, multi-head attention can be implemented with or without self attention. But so if you want to use self-attention, you can't have like a decoder like this because your key value and query has all be the same. So you'll probably like, um, if, if, if you were to be using self-attention, um, you probably, we will probably not use self-attention, but we will have like a self-attention layer here so that we will have like a key value query and then do something uh, with, with these things essentially. So here query is the hidden vector of the decoder. Yes. Uh, so query here is the, you know, whatever this decoder outputs. So yes, um, we use the raw hidden vectors outputted by the decoder as a query. And then this is your design choice, but you can either use this 
hidden vectors, I'll put it by encoder as both key and value, or you can have a separate linear projection layer, um, key and value, you know, linear projections to have key and values separately. Both will work well. Um, that's why I have off, I marked this as optional. Um, so you know you can either project your hidden dimensions to key and value separately and output key and value, or you can just output hidden dimensions. That's completely up to you. All right. Um, and so the you know the multi head. Let um, just to have a quick recap of the multi head attention. Um, so multi head attention is we said um, you know. Uh, something that many students were confused here was that with one hidden vector from the encoder, we are essentially, in this case, there's two number of heads. We're essentially outputting two pairs of key and values. And my question was that how are we outputting two different keys and values given one hidden vector? And many students mistakenly think that we have two separate weight matrices, um, you know, like a key one, and key two, something like this, this is not true. Um, we typically have only one key weight matrix, one value ma weight matrix, one query weight matrix, and then there will be one output weight matrix here. Um, so the way you do it is typically you essentially, so given this batch size by maximum sequence length by key dimension vector, you essentially reshape and transpose to make this uh, batch size by number of heads by sequence length by key divided by number of heads. Um, so essentially what we're doing is we divide this uh, key dimension, you know, we reshape this into like this, right? So we, we're essentially calculating multiple attentions in a different portions of your input um, by dividing this into, you know, num multiple number of heads. Uh, so here, you so if, if your number of heads is two, then you're, you'll be calculating two separate attention scores. Uh, so these will be something like, you know, batch size by number of heads uh, by sequence length. So you'll have two separate attention, sequence length attention scores for each of your head. And then we, you know, we, we do a matrix multiplication with value and then we concatenate. Concatenating is done by reshaping, and then we project it into the final output layer, which is this. Um, so it's it's slightly more involved, but the main idea behind having one linear projections for each of key query value remains the same. Wouldn't this cutting reduce the free flow of information? Um, Could you clarify your question, Euclid? Uh, no. I was thinking that if you cut the space, like uh, cut the hidden state into K part, and then maybe there is some interaction between say part one and part two, but now you are only looking at like only the single part, wouldn't that be very harmful? That's, um, that's a good question actually. Um, I haven't thought about it, so I can't really give you like a good answer. But the um, I guess to coming back to this example, uh, you know, like here for the little girl, it's we, we went through this yesterday. But but the little girl case, it's attending to this hair. But with the self attention, we'll be dividing um, the image. For example, let's say we have four number of heads, then we'll be dividing this image into four parts. Um, and then, and then in this first, in this second quadrant, it will be attending to the hair, but in the second quadrant, maybe it will be attending to some flowery uh, clothing she has. And in the third, in this third quadrant, maybe like it will attend to the teddy bear part for the girl. But the idea is that um, by having multiple heads, we can attend to, you know, we can have high attention weights for different portions of the input essentially. Whereas if you have only one um, attention, then even if this flowery portion, you know, have like a, deserves like a high attention weight, since we take a soft max, if this portion has relatively much greater weight, then this portion of the input will be sort of ignored. Um, whereas in the self attention case, both portions can be assigned sort of like an equal importance weight. 
So it's like a, I think it's like from what you say, it's very like a, the max pulling in CNN. Like you are looking at the maximum like locally, like a small window, like the important part mm -hmm. in a local window. Maybe like uh, like maybe not the operation itself, but the idea could be similar. We have like four quadrants where we each pull like a highest weight attention. Maybe maybe um, can't really uh, guarantee. I guess. <laughs> okay. Cool. Thanks. Mm -hmm. All right. Any remaining question on the attention part? <clears throat> All right, um, another optional here is uh, dropout. I think uh, even the multi torch dot, torch and end dot multi head attention has a dropout optional. You can add a uh, dropout, uh, uh, like a, um, you know, optional dropout here. And I think the most relevant place that many people put in is, um, let's see, after you do the softmax, a lot of people put dropout in, in this uh, computed attention before you compute it with the value. And I think this is also where the transformer uh, paper also does it. So um, having this optional dropout layer is completely up to you. So Kunal's, Kunal asked, so here, wouldn't having multiple weight matrices looking at entire sequence be more beneficial? Uh, maybe that's true, but as you as we said, um, introducing multiple weight matrices is a pretty big. You know, you, you have to introduce quite a lot of uh, uh, weight linear transformations. You know, for each of the attention, you have to introduce uh, key, query, and value. Um, even if you aren't using multi-edit attention, so there there are quite a lot of you know weights you have to introduce by having you know more weight matrices. So that's obviously possible, but it's something you have to also consider. All right. <clears throat> All right, so here's the decoder part. Um, I guess one thing that we have to note is that we are using LSTM cell. Uh, I guess I, I'll start from the embedding part. Um, so here in the encoder, each input is a speech uh, null spectrogram data, right? So each frame has a, it's a 40 dimensional vector. It's a continuous vector. So you can just use the raw null spectrogram data as your input to the encoder. But for the decoder case, um, you know, our things are English or alphabet, right? So, and then in the first part of our code in the create dictionary, and transform letter to index, we transform our letters to index. Um, and then this, and then that embedding here is essentially a, um, you know, a lookup table. It will be a, it will be like a vocab size by some um, hidden dimensional, um, you know, this is another hyperparameter you have to choose. It will be some hidden dimensional, um, you know, embedding for each of the vocab each of the word in your vocab, you will have a DE dimensional vector essentially. Um, so this is embedding. This is, uh, it's kind of omitted from this figure, but you can imagine like an embedding layer here. This is some, after you pass through the embedding layer, it will be fed into the in court first um, LSTM layer. And another thing we have to note here is that these two LSTMs are LSTM cell not the LSTM layer. Um, what the difference here is essentially for the LSTM layer, you have to feed in like the whole sequence, but then for LSTM cell, you, we are feeding in each input step. The reason we are doing this is because for each step, we have to calculate the context vector and then feed that into the next layer and so on. Uh, that's the only reason we are using LSTM cell. You can check out the documentation, but essentially 
The only difference is that your input is a batch size by hidden dimensional instead of batch size by sequence length by hidden dimensional. And then your output will also not depend on sequence length. Um, and as per the paper, we I left two LFDM cell here, one for this, one for this. Um, and then we will initialize the attention. Um, and then we'll capsize the character probability layer is just the final MLP layer, which is this layer. Um, in case you want to try using the, um, what is it, the wait time, then what you will be doing is essentially uh, you'll have a transpose of this embedding layer. You know, the transpose of this embedding layer is the E by vocab size. And then you will essentially use this linear transformation as your character probability. And then, you know, whatever, you know, you get vocabulary size vector is a probability vector, right? Uh, so you can just use this to the, as the uh, final output to your cross entropy loss. Uh, yep, I guess we kind of provided um, uh, the code here, uh, but you have to do like uh, transpose, I believe. Okay, any question in the initialization part? Okay, so the forward, you know, key and value are the things that are outputted by, or key and value and quarter line are all everything that are outputted by your encoder. Um, I guess just as a quick recap, your encoder length has to account for the reduction in input length that we perform in the pyramidal LSTM. So if you have three pyramidal bi-directional LSTMs, you will have your uh, encoder length, your encoder length will be, you know, your original input length divided by eight or something like, something close to that. Um, and then we also have Y here and then mode here. Mode here is to just, um, you know, mark as train or test um, you know, since we'll be using teacher forcing, that's why we have it here. And that's why we also have uh, Y as an input to the forward function. Typically, for most of your homework, you, you would have never had to use Y in your forward function. But for this, for teacher forcing, we have. Okay, so, um, you know, if the mode is trained, um, I guess maybe I can go back to this slide. Um, so, you know, decoder, we output the probability distribution over the vocabulary. Um, and in the training step, since we already know the full length of your target, we only generate your length, sequence length number of targets. This is to ensure that you can, you know, calculate the divergence between your, you know, you, you can't calculate divergence between six, your array of six, length six and array of length seven, right? So we just generate up to up until the sequence length number of uh, things. Um, and then for this use, this is essentially our Y here is, oh, sorry. Our Y here is, is a uh, character, right? So we'll also have to, you know, if, if, if you are implementing a word-based model, you will have to uh, have a, like a word embeddings of your, each of the word in your Y. If you're doing a character-based model, then you will need embeddings for each of the character in your Y. And if it's not a train mode, then this is just some arbitrary number we have. Uh, we'll just output a lot of, you know, a lot of things, and then uh, in the in the real case, in when in, in the evaluation mode, we'll, you know, we'll find the first EOS uh, token, and then mark that as the end of sentence, essentially. Um, so here is this mask is the mask you will be using for attention. Um, and as I said, uh, you know, going back to this example, if we have a batch size of two and the first sequence is length five and then the uh, second sequence is length three, then you'll have to generate a mask that looks like, um, like this so that you'll be able to assign zero attention rate in these two portions. Obviously you'll have a lot longer batch size, so your mask will look a little more complicated, but that's pretty much uh, the idea behind using mask.
Okay. Um, <clears throat> so this predictions array will just store the predictions you make um, as we go through. Um, and this prediction is a single uh, prediction. Um, I guess the hint is this. Remember what you start with. Um, your starting token is always, you know, the same for your decoder. Um, so that's just what the prediction needs to be in the initial stage. Um, and the for the hidden states, um, for this initially, uh, we feed in like zero. Um, you can obviously do feed in something else, but uh, you know by default we fit in zero values for the hidden state. Um, the first none here will correspond to this guy, and then the second um, none here will correspond to this guy essentially. And then you know after the first thing we'll be updating. Um, we'll we'll be updating the first hidden state with whatever your first LSTM cell provided, and the second none with the second whatever hidden state that your second LSTM cell provided. Okay, and then, um, and also here we said that your RNN depends on the hidden states from the previous time step, and then the concatenated version of uh, your embedding, and then the context. So you will need to initialize your context. Obviously, you can just initialize as zeros. Um, zeros always work, but fine. So um, you just need to initialize the context. You just need to and uh, be careful with the size. And obviously, your you know the when you're thinking of what the dimensions of your LSTM cells should be, you should take account of obviously your embedding size and the context size, uh, everything like that. And since your character probability, you know, will also depend on these two. So uh, you will also have to think about how, like you just need to be a little careful with um, all these dimensions, essentially when you're initializing all the, all the model classes. Okay, so this is really the main um, loop in of the decoder. Um, as you can see, we'll be iterating through the max length, uh, which is defined as the shape of your Y, which is the max sequence length if it's a training mode, or 600 if it's a evaluation mode. In the train mode, we will want to use a teacher forcing. Um, in, you know, in the first time step, as I said, the first time step is always this token. Um, so you'll just need to input, um, you know, this prediction that you initialize early on. It's it's going to be a little confusing right now, but um, as as soon as you start looking into the code a little more detail, um, this will make a lot of sense. And this is really uh, the part where many students, um, you know, make mistakes. If oh, I guess I guess I should first clarify this. Um, if using teacher forcing, this condition should be some kind of random probability. So like, let's say we're using a teacher forcing rate of 95%. Then with 95% of the times, this if clause should be um, you know, activated and 5% of the times this else, uh, else clause should be activated essentially. Yeah, and then once in the 95% of the case, let's assuming that uh, we set the teacher forcing rate to 95%. Um, if it's not the first iteration, if it's you know from i equals one, <clears throat> then we need to feed the label of the previous time steps. So if you're generating um, uh, so if you're generating Y3, you need to feed the label of Y2, not Y3. It's an obvious thing, but then a lot of students actually make mistake here. So make sure you feed in the label of the previous time step, the correct label of the previous time step. And in 5% of the times when we aren't using teacher forcing, 
we will be using the embedding of the previous prediction. So um, let's say y2 hat is our prediction, then we'll be feeding this y2 hat uh, instead of y2. Something like this. Any question on the teacher forcing part? So you'll first concatenate a Y context vector. Um, this is essentially this. Uh, we concatenate the you know embedding of the Y, and then we concatenate the context vector as well. As I said, um, you initialize your context vector as something here, so you can just easily concatenate them, and then we feed into the first layer of LSTM. Uh, we'll just feed into this this layer of LSTM, um, and then we update the hidden states, the first non-value that we initialize up there, uh, and then we also feed into the next layer of LSTM. We also update uh, this, you know, the second hidden state, and then um, you know you just need to set what the query is. It's you know, it's whatever the hidden vector that's outputted by the second decoder. And then um, we have we have key and value coming from the encoder, and then mask we define here, and query we just got it from the second RNN layer. So we we calculate the context and attention, and we just store the first you know attention of this batch. Uh, as I said, this attention plot is just for debugging. Uh, we don't actually use this attention error anywhere else because we already used it to calculate the context. So uh, we'll just, you know, append this one attention. Um, you can obviously change whatever batch number you want. Um, so we we calculate the context of CI here, and then the output context, you know, which will be calculated by. Uh, you will just need to concatenate something. Uh, this this context and uh, uh, Second or, or the query essentially, you just need to concatenate query and context, output context, and then the final prediction becomes you know goes through the finer linear layer, um, which is this one. You can, you know, obviously you can definitely implement like a deeper MLP layer, like you like you probably did in your homework three, but I wouldn't say it's very necessary. You can probably get like a very good. Um, performance without it. And I doubt that it will have like a very big impact on your performance as well. Okay. <clears throat> and then you just need to, you know, store the prediction, which will obviously be the argmax of your uh, thing that you predicted. And um, you just need to, we're just storing all the predictions we made for all of the batches at each iteration. Um, yep. Yeah. And then we iterate through the sequence length in the train mode, uh, we, we, we make predictions for the maximum sequence length in that batch. And finally, we just stack all the attention plots. Um, so you can essentially think that uh, for each batch, we generate one row, and then uh, we stack all these things to make a 2D attention plot. Um, and then for the prediction, we also just concatenate all the predictions we have. Um, that's pretty much it. Uh, we output predictions and attentions, um, and that's the end of decoder. Any question in the decoder? Okay, so this is the last part, last class of your model. Um, so we're just combining the encoder and decoder. Uh, we'll just call it a sequence to sequence model. Um, you just need to implement your encoder, initialize your encoder um, with some you know, 
these are mostly hyperparameters uh, that you need to decide. Uh, I, I just recommend, um, I, I'm not actually sure if the paper provided, but you can just use like a very typical numbers like 128, 256, and you'll be able to gain uh, good, good enough results. Uh, initialize decoder here as well. In the forward function, we essentially, you know, put our X and X lens into the encoder. We get key value and the truncated encoder length uh, as the output of the encoder. And we put this encoder uh, key value and the encoder length into your decoder along with Y and mode, um, if it's a trading mode. And then uh, I guess since we output attentions here, um, you will have to, it will be a tuple of predictions and attentions, and then you can just output these um, as the output of your forward function. All right. So just one thing. Um, I guess there's really not much to uh, do left, but uh, one thing that we need to note here is the use of reduction equals none in the cross entropy laws. Um, so the, the reduction in the cross entropy loss uh, documentation, if you check, is by default mean which means that you just take a mean of your loss. Uh, but then in here, we want to set it to none because of the uh, difference in sequence length. You know, the, out, the output sequence length is different uh, by each element in your batch. So if you just um, blindly take a mean of all the sequence in the batch, then we're essentially also taking like our denominator is biased, right? Because um, every every element in your batch will be divided by the maximum sequence length, but then there will be like every element except for the last, ex except for the one with the maximum sequence length will, will have a lower sequence length. So our, our you know, our loss will be essentially a biased uh, measure. So in the train function, um, you know, we'll, we'll essentially go through the train loader, like. Uh, you must be very familiar with this, but after we get the predictions and attentions from the model, um, we actually have to generate another mask um, that takes account for uh, the length essentially. So for example, like it's essentially the same, um, like say our batch size is two and then maximum sequence length is five. Um, and then we'll have to generate another mask that looks like this. Uh, just note that before, when we're computing the attention, um, we did this for the input length, but in the decoder, we're doing this for the target length. That's the only difference of this mask, uh, but you still have to generate some kind of mask that, uh, you know, like what you use for these mark is up to you. Like you can use completely like true and false is fine, uh, you actually can't generate tensors with true and false, so you'll have to use some kind of numbers. But just mark, uh, it's it's like a binary you know, variable. You, you just need to mark which portions, um, which portions of your target that you need to be actually computing the loss. And then there's also another um, torch function like torch masked select or something. So before when you're computing attention, you, you should have used like torch mask uh, fill in or something. In here, you'll, you'll use like torch mask select. Uh, you essentially select the ones with one, and then only among those, you compute the mean. That's it. Um, so here, we generate a mask like this, and then we just uh, co compute the criteria. You know, we'll use Y and the predictions you made, um, and then we'll essentially get the mask loss using this mask and loss and take the mean of that. And then there's an optional gradient clipping. Um, you know, if you aren't you if you haven't used it for your homeworks, uh, the previous homeworks, I recommend you uh, consider using this. It's like a one-liner thing um, that's heuristically known to work work very well. And then you can just compute the Levenstein distance if you want. Um, some people like to track Levenstein distance in the training step as well. 
Um, and then you can also plot your attention like here, um, you know, to check if your implementation is correct. Any question on the training part? All right, um, I guess I'll just go over the final. Um, this is, Eason was the previous um, previous TA for the last semester and some suggestions he made uh, for the debugging, you know, try to set your batch size to two and then, you know, go through all the encoder, decoder and everything. A lot of people actually set batch size to one. And if you stick to that, a lot of things might break um, if, once you increase your batch size. So I, I also suggest you to set it to two. Um, and then, you know, like check the shapes of all the intermediate variables are matching. That's really probably the most important part of debugging. Um, and be careful, be careful with the uh, learning rate. If you're using Atom scheduler, typically you start with a lower learning rate. If you're using a stochastic gradient descent, you will probably start with a slightly higher learning rate and so on. Um, and it's just attention, to, you know, it, it takes a little more time for to converge. Um, so you may have to wait a little more. You may have to wait for a few epochs until you can see the diagonal plot. Um, okay, so make sure you have correctly handled the situation for time step equals zero when teacher forcing. Um, you know, as I said, the hint is the SOS token. Um, yeah, and also we highly recommend you to use teacher forcing because um, without it, like it, it may take a very long time for your model to converge. And here's some tips, you know, um, for you to pass from B to A. Uh, I won't consider it at this moment because, you know, most of the students haven't um, even started implementing. Uh, maybe we will we'll have another session um, um, about this later on, but you are obviously welcome to read and implement anything on your own. All right, any final question before we end the uh, bootcamp? Uh, so is encoder decoder specifically designed to solve this kind of delayed many to many prediction problem? Not really, um, not necessarily. I guess it, it is definitely specify uh, like um, efficient for you know, delayed many to many prediction problem. But if you actually consider it like a language modeling problem, um, so this is like not delayed, right? Language modeling could be delayed as well, but in this case, it just has a one-to-one -one correspondence. Um, but here, so this is the embedding part. And then this is the encoder part. You essentially encode the necessary information from your embedding. And then this MLP layer is also considered the decoder. Um, so it, the encoder decoder is just the idea, like it's not necessarily designed for delayed many-to-many -many prediction problem, but uh, I, I guess a lot of researchers found it, you know, reasonable to have a encoder and decoder separately. And, you know, encoder serves the purpose of encoding the necessary information. It's, it's specialized in encoding the information uh, into certain, you know, in some arbitrary hidden dimension. And decoder, on the other hand, is specialized in decoding what the encoder generated. So I guess many researchers found this intuitive. Um, can you share how long approximately you make it work last year? Um, hold on. Maybe I, I, I still have it. So I used a GPU V100 and it took me 200 and, oh, I'm sorry, around 700 seconds to train this for each epoch. This means that for a normal, so if you're using Colab Pro, you'll be using P100 
and P hundred would take around um. So what's that? Um, seven hundred. What's what is that number? Um, like around thirty minutes for each epoch, and then let's see. Um. Yeah, I don't, I don't have um, any data uh, on how many epochs it took to, um, you know, have like a good result, but it seems like I trained up to like 60 epoch or something like that. So, um, you know, you, you have a rough idea, right? Like, like for attention, you it'll take probably like, for, for you to see like a diagonal attention, it will take you like 10 to 20 epochs at the minimum. Uh, for toy data set, it might take a little shorter time, but attention alone takes like 20 pops to converge. So uh, I would say, you know, you need to at least train for something like 30 pops. Um, then that actually gives quite a long training time, I guess. Oh, oh, um, so Yukun's asking like, um, how much time it takes for you to fill in the notebook blank. So um, I, I can't really give you on a good measure because um, we did it, we, this is not like, we're providing a lot more hint this semester. Um, like we are, uh, the notebook initially was given to us was, you know, very brief. It was a lot shorter than the notebook that we were giving. And only after a week or two, we were given some annotated notebook. Uh, and even then we, I don't think we went through it as thoroughly as, uh, we did today. So I can't really give you a good estimate, but it really depends on people. If you have a good understanding, I think I started with a pretty good understanding of the encoder decoder architecture in general. So it didn't take me much time to implement. And once you have a correct implementation then it like, you can actually finish in a few trials, like there's not much hyperparameter tuning to do and so on. So, um, yeah, I would say once you have a correct implementation, it wouldn't take too much time for you to finish. I, I would recommend, you know, like um, if you have, if you have like a uh, confusion still, then um, you should rewatch the bootcamp. We'll be uploading in the next few days. And then maybe when, when you are working on it, working on homework four, um, you can sort of go through with the bootcamp, um, you know, line by line, and then whenever you have any confusion, you can just revisit uh, that part of the bootcamp. And you know, not many students uh, joined today, so I'm assuming that we're going to have a lot of Piazza posts uh, later on. So we might post another um, bootcamp session. Maybe not. Uh, we'll see. Thanks for coming to the bookcam. I'll I'll finish the recording.